Hey everyone, welcome back. Let's talk a little bit about religion and religious tenets in humankind, as well as some of the related civics. And we're going to start here with founding your religion. When you get to 10 population in your empire, and that includes on cities, outposts, and units, you get the option to found your religion. And you get two options, polytheism and shamanism. Polytheism gives you plus five faith for the number of attacked territories that you have in your empire, and shamanism gives you plus one faith per population. Now, shamanism scales really well later into the game. You're going to have much more population than you have territories as you get into eras like the early modern and the industrial and the contemporary. But in my opinion, polytheism is much more important early on, and religion in particular you need to have the early faith generation because the tenets are competitive and they're usually going to be picked by the medieval or even by the early modern perhaps uh, depending on the specific builds of empires and how much faith output they have and all that kind of stuff personally i pick polytheism almost every single game even as the harappans and that's just because uh, sh with shamanism you need five times as many population as you have territory and a lot of the early game is really about expansion and adding territories into your city it's going to be very very rare that early game you get more faith from your population than you get from territories now later in the game it does have the effect of doing things like increasing your food output from Angkor Wat but in my opinion it's not really worth it to give that up in order to or it's not really worth it to take that while giving up the option to perhaps take some tenets earlier, because polytheism will allow you to do that in almost every single case. Now, if there is some niche situation where you're, like, really tile-limited, uh, you have maybe just a couple territories and you're being blocked by uh, another neighbor, then you might want to go for shamanism and really focus on building up your one or two really big cities. But in almost every situation that I've found myself in, polytheism has been the superior pick. So what are the cultures that are going to be good for early religion? There are a few things to keep in mind, and it's going to depend on exactly how you want to play your religious game. But if you really want to get all the tenets you want, there are some cultures that are better than others. And specifically, cultures that are able to grow population very quickly are better at securing religious tenets. Because religious tenets unlock when you have a certain number of state religion followers. The first tier is 15 followers, and the requirements continue to increase all the way up to tier 4. The more population you have, the easier it is to get religious followers and get tenets earlier. The other thing is, can you generate faith? Now, the early cultures in the ancient era can't generate faith, but one culture in particular unlocks an option that isn't realistic for others, and that is the Olmex. And specifically, early in the game, when you get to a certain number of population, you will unlock Founding Myths. Now, Founding Myths gives you a choice between Natural Right and Divine Mandate. In pretty much every game, you are going to take Natural Right for plus 5 influence on the main plaza. This is really good in the early game. It helps you expand out to your different territories and found outposts and attach stuff, all that good stuff that you want to do, potentially claim a wonder. It's an excellent choice. You're going to take it pretty much every game, and if you're a beginner and or you're just playing on Humankind difficulty for the first time, I would still suggest you take that one. However, with the Olmecs, and to an extent the Assyrians as well, you can choose Divine Mandate. And Divine Mandate has really two effects. First, it gives you plus three faith on your territory. So the more territory you have, the more faith you're going to get, and it combines really well with the religion, religion that you took earlier, giving you faith on territory. But additionally, it moves you towards the Tradition Axis, which gives you additional faith on territory at the cost of five stability on your cities, which is pretty easy to manage. So between Divine Mandate and Tradition, with the plus two, 
and the foundation of your religion, you can have plus 10 faith on all your territories, which is going to convert your population very, very quickly, as well as convert all your neighbors. And what enables the Olmecs to do this is that they get extra influence output from their Olmec heads, as well as plus one influence per territory that they control. Additionally, because the Olmec heads exploit the surrounding food tiles, and it encourages you to surround that Olmec head with agrarian quarters, it means that you are also going to have a lot of population, which means you can get your tenants earlier. So in my opinion, the Olmecs are still the best choice if you're really, really focused on er early religion. I don't think they're the best choice overall. There are a lot of other options. Uh, part of that ha probably has to do with the relative weakness of some of the religious tenets as well, but we will get into that in a minute. Now, there are some other early civics you unlock. You unlock legitimacy at the same time as, uh, or as um, founding myths, and you get two options, which is customary laws and codified laws. Now, codified laws gives you minus 20% on attached outposts and minus 20% on absorbed city, and it moves you towards progress. Customary laws gives you minus 50% outpost creation cost and moves you towards tradition. Now, if you take customary laws and divine mandate, you won't quite get to the plus four faith on territory. You'll be one bar away. So you have to get an event to move over if you really want to go hardcore on that side. But the minus 50% uh, create outpost cost is really nice, uh, particularly if you are playing the Olmex and you want to get a lot of territory and you have taken the other civic that gives you more faith rather than more influence. Okay. Finally, let's talk about religious rights. Uh, this one isn't quite as relevant. Uh, you'll unlock it when you get 10 state religion followers, but the relevant option here is uh, minus 30% industry costs on religious districts, so it'll allow you to get your holy sites out earlier. And I believe this also applies to wonders that count as holy sites if you want a discount there. It does move you towards the individualism access rather than the collectivism, so you'll be getting a percentage money modifier rather than a percentage industry modifier. So those are the early game tenants you should know about, or the early game civics you should know about. Let's talk about tenants. We're just going to go in order, starting at tier one, which unlocks with 15 religious followers. The very first tenant that you unlock is Eshoo Gluttony. And Eshoo Gluttony is plus five money on luxury resource deposits. Uh, right away, you can tell this has a very obvious synergy with the Nubians. Uh, the Nubians already get extra money on both luxury and strategic resources, and this will give them even more. But there are uses for this beyond that. One of the hardest stars to get, in my opinion, is the Merchant Stars. And if you don't focus on it, you really need to have like people in traders or a lot of market quarters in order to get money. And you still need a lot of market quarters anyway, regardless of who you're playing. This will help you secure at least one of those era stars in the early game and allow you to get a little extra fame. But also, buying out units is actually quite efficient, particularly in the early game. It's way less costly than buying districts. So what this means is Eshoo Gluttony can actually be an okay pick for someone like a militarist or expansionist, or even if you know you have to play defensively and need some units and you want to focus your production on doing other things. Particularly for someone like the Mycenaeans or someone like the Hittites, you can use this money to buy out a, a chariot or your Promacoy or an archer or whatever and work on your Cyclopean fortress or work on a maker's quarter or work on a harbor, whatever it is that you need. You'll find that the buyout costs of units in the ancient era is actually relatively reasonable. And this allows you to focus on the production and the population that you need to support yourself later in the game. Now, it does fall off quite a bit, and it's dependent on how many luxury resources you have. I have spawned in areas where I have access to 10 luxury resources right out of the gate, and I've spawned in areas where I have zero or one in any adjacent territory. So obviously it depends on your luxury resource access. The other thing to consider with this tenant is really what else is available. Because the scaling on this is not amazing. It does get affected by some modifiers later in the game. 
Um, but this is definitely more of an early game pick, and it's not something you're going to be relying on very much later in the game. So let's talk about Be in Harmony with Nature next, which gives you plus two stability on rivers. This one's actually really nice. I quite enjoy this. It allows you to build out these big cities that are along rivers and be able to support a lot of districts. And stability, as you get into the medieval in particular, does become an issue, and it starts to fall off after that. You can maintain it more easily, particularly once you get vaccinations in the early modern. But uh, starting in the medieval in particular, and even like the mid-classical and late-classical, stability can become an issue, and you end up putting a lot of production into stability infrastructure and stability uh, districts like the Commons Quarter or the Garrison. And this plus two stability on river, if you have a decent sized river, you can really sustain your stability much higher for a much longer period of time without having to make any of those investments. One thing to be aware of though is that it seems like you lose that stability if you put a quarter on top of the river. I've also seen the tooltip tell me that I lose the stability if I place a quarter next to the river. I'm not sure if that's a bug or if that's intended or not. But do keep that in mind if you pick this tenant. Who is it good for is really anyone. It's more map dependence than culture dependence. Everyone wants to build big cities that can produce a lot of things. And this is going to help you do that. What it really depends on is what your map looks like. How many rivers do you have? What does your second city look like? What do your other city settlements locations look like? If you have a lot of rivers, great choice. If not... Obviously, don't pick it. Now, Steel Knot is one I'm not a big fan of. And Steel Knot gives you plus one influence on mountains. So, plus one influence can be good. But the issues with Steel Knot are bigger than that. The first is that it's very map generation dependent. Yes, you can get some times where you get a lot of mountains in your map. And in those times, you're also likely to pick the Zhou, right? Now, most of the time, though, you're only talking a few handful of mountains, a really small handful. And the bigger issue with Steel Knot is that you have to be working the mountains in order to get the influence. So you need to have your city built nearby. So what does this mean for Steel Knot? In my opinion, it means that there are two cultures that this works best with. First are the Zhou, because if you pick the Zhou, it's likely that you are going to be working a decent number of mountain tiles early in the game, and this will help provide you with extra influence. The influence in particular is really good for the Zhou, because they are an Esthete culture that don't have another option to generate influence, really, other than the civics picks that everyone else has access to. So if you've taken the Joe and you have a lot of mountains, this can be an okay pick. The other option actually are the Mycenaeans, because the Mycenaeans, when they place down their Cyclopean fortress, it also acts as a maker's quarter, which means that it exploits the tiles around it. So if you've settled a city and you have mountains in some other location in a territory or in an attached territory, you can plop down your Cyclopean Fortress right next to the mountains, which you want to do anyway because they have great production values and are boosted by infrastructure, but you'll also be getting influence from the mountains as well. So those two cultures are, in my opinion, probably the only times you're going to be taking this. There may be a few niche scenarios with other cultures where you have a lot of mountains that are easily workable that you might take steel knot, but otherwise you're probably going to leave it on the table. Next we have Smite Unbelievers, and Smite Unbelievers is great for people focusing on military. It gives you plus 25 experience on creating units on all cities, and minus 1 unit upkeep on units. The minus 1 unit upkeep is okay early in the game. Later on, it doesn't really matter that much because of the very high upkeep of units. But the plus 25 experience on creating all units means that your units are going to generally have veterancy 1 right out the gate, which gives them plus 1 combat strength. So if you've played Humankind difficulty, you know how important combat strength is. You know how important it is to have that CS advantage over your AI opponents. But even in multiplayer, having a CS advantage over another player is still really good. So basically you get like half the effect of the Mycenaean Legacy trait with this. Obviously you can also stack it with the Mycenaean Legacy trait. 
and you can sack it with like the Russians, for instance, to get a ton of veterancy right out of the gate. Overall, this is honestly a really good pick. Is it top tier? Um, yeah, I mean, maybe. It depends on your game. Uh, particularly if you're going for a heavy warfare game, then yeah. If you're uh, penned in a little bit and defending against a really aggressive culture, you can also take this pick and do fairly well with it. So next you have Purge Idleness, and Purge Idleness gives plus two food on coastal water and plus two food on lakes. Purge Idleness is actually really good, but it's another one that's very situationally dependent. So the times you're going to take Purge Idleness is when you have a lot of shallow water on your coastline. It's likely that you'll have taken someone like the Phoenicians, Carthaginians, or Norsemen when you pick this, and those emblematic harbors increase the effectiveness of this, right? Because each harbor works the two tiles, two tile radius around it in the water, not on land. So what you're looking for when you have harbors are these um, sort of more concentrated areas of shallow water rather than these thin sort of outlines that you sometimes get. So you want a thick concentrated area of shallow water so that you can work as much as possible. And when you get that, you can actually sustain a decently sized city just using harbors alone. You put one down in your main territory, you have a couple attached territories that you can put harbors in, and then if you've picked someone like the Phoenicians or the Carthaginians, you can get more emblematic harbors that are going to get you a lot more food than they otherwise would. So you can do fairly well with this civic, and if you have a lot of water in the territory that you've started your culture, your civilization in, then I would recommend picking this as long as you're going to go for harbors at a decently early point in the game. So I've already listed the obvious synergies, but this can work with anyone. You don't need the emblematic quarters to make this more effective, but it does make it quite a bit better and able to sustain much larger populations if you're able to get some emblematic harbors since you're typically limited to just one harbor per territory. Next we have Ebsane from Intoxicants. And Ebsane from Into Intoxicants is one that I really want to like, but I have some issues with. It gives plus two industry on forests and plus two industry on woodlands. Um, in my opinion, most of the time you just don't have enough forest or woodland to really justify taking this pick. Um, so this really comes back to map generation. I think if you get like the god roll and you have a ton of forest or woodland in your territory that's easily exploitable, this could be a good pick. Say you have, you know, 10 forest in your territory that you're able to work and you get that plus two industry on forest, you're getting plus 20 industry. And that can be like a 40% boost to your industry in the early game, depending on just how much industry you have. The issue is that you're very unlikely to ever come across that situation. You really need a lot of luck on your map generation in order to justify this. Much more luck, I think, than you need for some of the other ones. So, potentially good. It does fall off later into the game. Most of your industry is going to come from other sources. But uh, it can help a lot in the early game, and that matters, so you can get that snowball effect. So... It is what it is. It's It can be good on anyone if you get the god roll. You're never going to turn down production, but uh, really consider how much value you're actually getting out of this before you pick it. So Seek Wisdom is kind of the science equivalent of a Shoe Gluttony. So a Shoe Gluttony gives a bonus on luxuries. Seek Wisdom gives plus five science on strategic resources. Now, Strategic resources are less common than luxuries by a fairly significant margin. You're likely to only have maybe one or two in your territory at the start of the game that you can actually work, and you'll get a few more as the game goes on and uh, your territory expands and all that. But science is also worth more on a one-to-one -one basis than money is. And particularly in the early game, if you have two strategic resource deposits and you're able to you know, pick Seek Wisdom, well, strategic resources deposits already have a little bit of science built in in most cases, but Seek Wisdom is going to amplify that. And with two, that's plus 10 to your science. It doesn't sound like that much, but in the early game, that can be like a 100% boost to your amount of science outputs. 
and it can actually allow you to move people off researchers and concentrate on other things in your civilization without having to dedicate a, a certain number of population to research because you're able to keep up decently well without doing that. So Seek Wisdom, in my opinion, is another one that's decent for anyone. You're probably not going to take it as the show because you have enough science output already. Um, arguably, same with the Babylonians, but anyone else, you can make this work, assuming you have a couple strategic resource deposits. And uh, honestly, it's not that bad, but again, it does fall off. Tide the Wealthy uh, is... <laughs> is amazing. It's probably better in multiplayer than single player, to be honest. But Tide of the Wealthy gives you plus 10 war support when you win a battle, and plus 10 war support when your opponent retreats. You already get a base amount of war support when this happens anyway. So when you take this, your opponent has to win, like, two battles and a little extra in order to make up for the war support that you get when you win a battle. This is really good. It allows you to really just roll over your enemy and keep your war support really high even if you lose a battle or you know lose a city have one occupied for a while whatever you can fight for a really long time using tide the wealthy and it means because your war support is so high when it comes to the peace conference you're going to be able to take more territories in the peace conference than you would be able to otherwise so tide the wealthy is great um, it means also you can go to war more often. Even if you start with lower war support, you can build it up over the course of the war more easily. So Tide to Wealthy, good option uh, for a warlike Civ. Also a good option if you have a neighbor warlike Civ and you just don't want him to have it. So uh, consider that an option as well. So those are the Tier 1 Tenets. Uh, my favorite is probably be in harmony with nature. I find that this one is uh, most often the one that I'll be picking because of the value of stability in the early game. Uh, but there are quite a few viable options in Tier 1, and a lot of them are going to be dependent on the particular game that you have. The two that aren't dependent are Smite Unbelievers and Tide the Wealthy that you are pretty much good in almost any circumstance because of how frequent warfare is. So second tier, we have Undertake Pilgrimage, which is a reduction in the cost of enacting civics and canceling civics on your empire. Undertake Pilgrimage is hot garbage and you should never ever take it. Um, the cost of enacting and canceling civics, it just doesn't matter. As you go on in the game, influence becomes less and less important. There's really nothing else to be spending it on anyway other than claiming wonders. And the cost of enacting civics really isn't that much relative to things like combining cities. So it's it's not good. Don't take this. I wouldn't ever take this on anyone given literally any other option. So let's move straight on to Reject Luxury. Reject Luxury gives you plus 10 war support when you uh, make demands. And you get extra war support when you have active demands. So it ticks up faster once you've made some demands. So re Reject Luxury works really well with people that are able to make demands a lot. So that's going to be people that have a really strong religion with a particular civic that allows you to make demands on people that are following different religions. But it also works for weak religions as well, because everyone else is going to be following a religion. The other time as well is with people that have perhaps taken esthetes in the past or have somehow gotten a really strong culture, because you're going to be getting a lot of the oppressing my people grievances. And oppressing my people grievances are great because they give you a claim on a particular territory, which means it takes less to take them in a war. So reject luxury means that you can be getting these grievances to get you more war support every time you demand them. So you build up war support all the way up to 100 really, really fast. And if you don't quite get there, the ticking war support you get from the active demands also adds up really fast. So Reject Luxury is great for uh, people that want to, again, go on the offensive a lot and just continually be at war. Because you can take more stuff every single war that you get into, and you can turn around and get into wars more frequently. Bear Not False Witness is uh, probably the best pick in the tier tied with Give Alms. Bear Not False Witness gives you plus 5 science on research quarters. 
Um, and the reason this is so great is because research quarters are spammable. There is no upper limit to the number of research quarters that you can have, other than your stability, which there are plenty of ways to deal with. So, plus five science on research quarters is amazing for literally everyone. Every single culture needs research quarters. And plus five on your research quarters is a really significant effect. And the more research quarters that you get, the better it is. I, I honestly can't praise this enough. And I should talk about Give Alms in the same vein here, because Give Alms gives you plus five money on your market quarters. And it's the same thing. You want to spam out market quarters. And in particular, the money stars can be really difficult to get if you haven't picked any merchants. And this can help you reach the money stars as well. Just like Bear Not False Witness can help you get the science stars. So basically, it takes uh, 10 science quarters or 10 market quarters to get plus 50 for these yields. Realistically, you're going to have quite a few more of these quarters in your empire than, than just 10. And these things are going to get affected by science modifiers or money modifiers on your city. It really is a very substantial increase to the amount of science and money you're going to get. And it scales well throughout the game because it's in a quarter that you're going to keep building as the game goes on. So I really can't praise these two enough. Uh, I think these are generally the best options in this tier. Next we have Raise Monuments. Raise Monuments gives plus 5 stability on garrison and plus 1 combat strength in combat for units in or adjacent to a garrison. Um, I'm not a big fan of this one. The extra stability on garrison is okay, but there are plenty of other ways to deal with stability, and you already have some ways to get increased stability on garrisons. Um, and emblematic quarters, unfortunately, don't actually count as garrisons so if you have like a bunch of strongholds or something this isn't going to help you the plus one combat strength when you're on or adjacent to the garrison is fine but it means that you have to fight around like your static defenses and honestly i'd rather just have the uh 25 experience from the last year that basically always gives me a plus one combat strength buff than having to stick around my garrisons in order to get that buff. It's just not that useful. Um, and I, I wouldn't recommend taking it most of the time unless your only other option is observe feasts or observe fasts. I mean, because observe fasts is uh, really, really terrible. Um, the problem with Observe Fast, it gives this plus 5 food on Harbor, which is sort of reminiscent of Give Alms and Bear Not False Witness. The issue is that you can only have one Harbor per territory, and there are plenty of territories that can't build a Harbor at all because they're landlocked. Or even if they could build a Harbor, they won't because they only have a couple tiles in their territory that are water. So <laughs> Observe Feast, even if you take all of the emblematic quarters that are harbors and put them in one territory, you're only getting plus 20 food from that, assuming you also have a basic harbor. Which, if you just take Purge Idleness as the tier 1 tenant, you can get that from, like, one harbor and one emblematic quarter. So, I don't know. This, this plus 5 food on harbor... Not very good, in my opinion. It's just not worth it. You don't have enough harbors in your game to generate a substantial amount of food off this. You need, like, two harbors just to support one extra population with Observe Fasts. So, I, I'm not a big fan of this. I'm open to having my mind changed, but I doubt it's going to. So, my opinion, uh, Bear Not False Witness, Give Alms, Reject Luxury are the top tier picks. Undertake Pilgrimage is absolute hot garbage, and you should never pick it. You can take observe or Raise Monuments or Observe Fast over Undertake Pilgrimage if you want. Uh, but if you've missed out on Reject Luxury, Give Alms, and Bear Not False Witness, then uh, you're pretty far behind in the religion game. And um, sorry to say, but you kind of get the leftovers. So Tier 3, we have another 6 options. So tier 3 first is develop the intellect, which gives you plus 20 science per alliance on empire. Uh, this is another terrible pick. This is constrained by the number of empires that are actually in the game, and by the number of alliances you have, obviously. Realistically, you're only going to have like one or two alliances, most likely, 
um, and it's possible you don't have any. But even if you allied every single empire in the game, that's only seven empires, which is going to get you 140 science. I mean, this is a tier three tenet. It should be better than that. Or you could have just taken this bear not false witness at the last tier, which gives you plus five on your research quarters. And four research quarters are the equivalent science output and the bonus that you get from that tenet as a single alliance except you're unlimited in the number of research quarters you can build and you always get their science output you don't need to maintain any alliances so i mean if you have a ton of alliances yeah sure you can get a little bit of science off this but because it's on your empire rather than on your city it's also not going to be affected by city modifiers to your science that you get later in the game so it makes the one in the previous tier even better than this. I just don't think this is enough science for such a conditional effect to really be worth it, particularly with how limited you're going to be on your number of alliances. Honorkin. So Honorkin is um, definitely a really good pick. And this is uh, a running theme with all of these sort of militarist kind of picks. So Honorkin gives you plus one movement speed on land and naval units and a reduction on the unit industry cost of minus 10%. So being able to move units around faster means you're more able to engage or avoid combat and dictate the terms of the engagement, it means you can move around in battle more quickly, and this tenant allows you to produce units for a little bit less cost, which means you can get more of them more quickly. Honorkin is great, and if you pick it, you'll really see the benefits of it. Obviously, if you if you picked the Assyrians, this combines really nicely. Uh, you can get some really supersonic speeds going. It can be a little bit overkill, and particularly if you get like the Lighthouse of Alexandria as well. I mean, you yes, you go really fast, but you really only need to go faster than the next fastest person, and not just be like super speed. But regardless of that, Honorkin is great. It gives you a lot of tactical and strategic versatility when it comes to moving your armies around. It gives you a nice little discount to your industry costs on top of it. So Honorkin, good for anyone. Obviously, more aggressive people are more likely to take this, but it has its uses on defenses as well. Never overlook Honorkin. Next, we have Challenge Orthodoxy, which gives you plus 15 industry on main plaza. Uh... This should be like a tier one tenant or a tier two. Um, and if it were tier two, it would need to be buffed. You can get plus 15 industry from like a single maker's quarter. So you're taking this to save yourself like 10 stability. It's not good. You don't get enough industry from this. And when you think about later in the game, when you're producing like 800, 1000 industry, something like that. It, it's just, it's so trivial. The amount of in industry you get from this is so small that I, I have difficulty justifying it over some of the other picks available. Now, if, like, everything else has been taken and I have the choice between, like, develop intellect and challenge orthodoxy, I'll still take challenge orthodoxy. But uh, outside of that situation, I, I probably am not going to pick this. This is another one of the scraps that get left over if you're late in the religion game. Sustain the Faithful is uh, okay. I'd say it's probably the weakest of the more warlike tenets. So you get plus 10 war support when an opponent refuses your demand, and plus 10 war support when an opponent breaks an agreement. And the reason that this one isn't quite as good is because the war support here is going to be dependent on your opponent's play rather than on your own. So they have to refuse your demands or they have to break agreements with you in order for you to get this extra war support. Uh, if I'm warlike, I've probably taken one of the tenets in the other two tiers in order to get me that war support, and then go for Honorkin this tier. If Honorkin is taken, you can take this one, um, but, you know, it's, it's not quite as good, in my opinion, as the previous two tiers. So, Mandate Patronage, plus two money per number of trade routes. This one's decent, actually. You can get a fair number of trade routes going uh, in, in any game, even on humankind difficulty. Particularly if you are like a merchant culture, you can really have a lot of trade routes going. 
it is dependent on maintaining those trade routes. Uh, but, you know, money, because it banks, uh, you can kind of just save it up and use it when you need it. So variations in your money income don't matter as much as they do with, like, conditional effects on science or production or whatever, where you want it to be really consistent. So this can be good. Um, and if you're going into... Uh, the medieval era and you pick like the Ghanaians and you're already going to be getting money per trade route from your emblematic quarter, then you can take mandate patronage and maybe you even get someone like the Persians later in the game. Uh, you can get a really decent chunk of money off just trade routes and passive income from trade routes. Now, I, I personally don't pick this tenant very much because I tend to play very aggressively. I don't like making a lot of treaties with other cultures and providing them with all the luxuries and strategics that I have. But if you are into that style of play, I do think this one is a viable option. Uh, this can, you know, generate you a, a decent chunk of change, you know, like per, potentially up to maybe a hundred gold per turn. Um, and that'll combine really nicely with some of the other effects that you can get on trade routes, depending on the cultures you've taken up to this point in the game and beyond. So be charitable gives you plus two influence on commons quarter. Um, basically you pick this if you're the Italians and no one else. Uh, stability is not really a big issue in the game as it is currently. So you're not going to be building a lot of commons quarters. Commons quarters have really low influence outputs naturally. I think it's either plus two or plus three off the top of my head. Um, so you can, you know, you can basically double your influence production on commons quarters by taking this, but you're just not going to have very many commons quarters. Most of your stability will be coming from garrisons earlier in the game, or perhaps legacy traits or, uh, you know, some other effects like the tier one tenant to give you stability on rivers, you'll, you'll just find you don't generate very much influence from this because of the lack of commons quarters. So if you're pursuing a strategy revolving around commons quarters for some reason, then yeah, go ahead and pick be charitable. Or if you plan to pick the Italians and, you know, you have some way to guarantee you'll actually get the Italians, which you may not because they're a fairly competitive culture, then yeah, be charitable can be really good with the Italians with their bonuses to the Commons Quarter. But otherwise, I don't value this one very much. And I have to say, overall, I'm really disappointed with Tier 3. Um, they're... The options here are not very powerful, particularly given some of the options in tier 2. Honorkin is pretty much always the one I go for in this tier if it's available. Otherwise, it's just kind of situational. Um, but Honorkin is the best tenant in the tier, uh, no doubt about it. So finally, we come to tier 4, where there are only 4 options available. The first is Beware False Prophets, which gives plus 50 science on Cultural Wonder. This one can be... Okay, so obviously you're not going to claim a lot of wonders because the AI are going to do it. They're going to get a lot of wonders before you. But every wonder you have, you're going to get 50 science. The thing is, though, is that you can take cultural wonders off the AI by taking their cities. So you can actually amass a pretty sizable number of wonders, particularly as you get later in the game. And say you have all of the wonders in the game, you're going to be generating as much uh, science off your wonders as you would a decently sized city. So even with, you know, four wonders, say you've built one or two yourself and you've taken a couple off the AI, plus 200 science is really not that bad. And originally I thought this wasn't great for tier four, but once I started digging into the math of it, it seemed better than I had originally anticipated. And cultural wonders are something that you really do want control of anyway. You'll often aim for cities that have a wonder that you want in your possession, even if just for the reason to take it off the AI or to take it off your multiplayer opponent. And, you know, it's not like you can spam cultural wonders and get a ton of this science, but, you know, it's the equivalent of this tier two tenant right here, right? Bear not false witness, you need 10 research quarters in order to get the same effect as one cultural wonder. So I do think that's actually a fairly reasonable ratio. It could be a little bit higher, perhaps, uh, but 
I think it would probably snowball a little bit too much out of control with someone who is uh, already snowballing and has a lot of wonders. So this one's okay. It's an okay pick. Obviously, if you don't have any cultural wonders, it's a horrible pick. But even if you just have like two to four, you can get an okay amount of science passively. And you can probably get another wonder or two later in the game as well, which will also increase your science output. So it's okay. Now, proselytize daily is uh, probably the worst thought out tenet in the game. Uh, proselytize daily gives you plus 20 stability on territories if the territories follow a foreign religion. The problem with this is that if you reach a tier 4 tenet, you are one of the religious leaders in the game if you're picking a tier 4 tenet, which means it is unlikely that your territories are following a foreign religion. You see the problem here. You're almost never going to actually get this plus 20 stability buff. And even if you did, plus 20 stability is really not that valuable by this point in the game that you're picking a tier 4 tenet. There are plenty of other ways to deal with stability, and there are better options that you can pick. And even, even if there weren't, you, you're not actually getting any effect from this. So don't pick this option, it's awful. Donate generously, plus 25 money per alliance on Empire. Uh, but you do get plus 3 maximum number of holy sites. So plus 25 money per alliance on Empire. It runs into the same problem as the science per alliance, where you're constrained by the number of alliances that you have. Realistically, you're only going to be getting like 50 gold off this. The reason you pick this is for the maximum number of holy sites. It allows you to build two more holy sites than the other options, which only allow for plus one to the holy sites. The issue I have here is that this used to be really good when there were a lot of tenants that gave you effects on holy sites, but those don't exist anymore. So holy sites are fine, they give you a little bit of stability and they give you some faith, but compared to some of the options, other options in the game, they don't give you that much. Like, think about the Kaiserdom or the Sultan Kami that give you faith per district. Um, or the Cathedral Gatica, which gives you uh, plus one faith per uh, population. Like, an, uh, yeah, an extra couple of holy sites are okay, but they don't really keep up with some of the later game religious effects. And without extra yields on holy sites... This plus three to maximum holy sites doesn't really matter that much. Like, yeah, it is much better than proselytize daily for sure, but I would put donate generously at three out of four with beware false prophets ahead of it. Now, meditate often is easily the best tenet in the tier, and every single person that gets up to tier four is going to take meditate often as their first choice 100% of the time if they are trying to play the game effectively. Meditate often gives you plus two combat strength on your units. That's it. And that's all it needs to do. It's, uh, it's already really good um, because combat and damage is based on the relative difference of combat strengths rather than total combat strengths. It is um, always useful. You're never going to regret taking this. It's going to help you roll over opponents with your extra combat strength. You're going to do more damage. You're going to be more effective in wars. You're going to win battles more often, which means you're going to have more war support. Meditate often is amazing. Just, just pick it. Just pick meditate often. Uh, don't even look back. And I don't think I need to say more about this because if you don't see the value of plus two combat strength, like... Play on higher difficulties. <laughs> um, like It cancels out the humankind uh, AI buff that they get with their plus two combat strength to actually put you on even footing. And this thing is just incredible. Just take it. So that wraps up our discussion of tenets. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed. And, you know, there are a lot of combinations that you can get into and a lot of different situations. It makes it difficult to discuss every tenet in every single possible situation with every single cultural combination possible. But hopefully you got an idea and a feel for some of these tenets and the kind of situations that you can pick them in, which ones are stronger relative to others, and which ones are a little bit more situational, and perhaps even which ones you should never really take. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time.